Welcome everybody, good evening. This is the Brotherhood Initiative Grooming and Self-Care Tip Event with our beloved guest speaker, Alfonso McGriff III. And if you could give us a introduction of personality. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name is Alfonso McGriff III. I was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. I am a um, writer. I like poetry and uh, I'm working on my third book and I'm looking forward to finishing it because it's much needed. This particular book is called The Roots of a Tree, The Genesis of a Conscious Conversation and it focuses on how we can be better at interacting with one another. Harmonious and productive communication. Um, I'm an inventor. I uh, created an idea in the hair care business. I thought about how to solve a problem. That's what inventors do. You see a problem, you want to solve it. And I created a tool, had the tool manufactured in China, produced the product, and, and, and literally started selling it. After getting a patent, I did get a, a patent for my idea as well. So. Uh, I'm an inventor. I call myself a self-proclaimed relationship maven as well. And um, I share information about how we interact. Uh, quiet as is kept, we like to box relationship interactions when in all actuality, it's, it's, it's what, it doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is. What matters is how we interact with each other. So um, that's why I but people like to hear it in these different categories. So I say, okay, well, I, I identify myself as a self-proclaimed relationship maiden as well. Um, my specialty, of course, is cosmetology and hair care business. I've been doing that since for 31 years. Um, working in a hair salon, I work on men and women. And um, of course, you learn a lot about people when you interact with people. And much of my experience is involved with human interaction. And much of what I learned and even what I'm gonna to share today is what I've learned from interacting with my fellow human beings. I also wanna say, um, I, I love you. I love you, I love you. I, um, I feel that as human beings, we all have an innate connection. And it's important for us to understand that so that somewhere in the back of our minds, we understand that everything I do is directly or indirectly affecting somebody else in some kind of way, in, in, in some form or fashion. So um, that's, that's a brief um, part of my history and my endeavors. And so today <clears throat> I've been asked I've been privileged. Um, I have the privilege of being here to speak about Central Connecticut State University. I have the privilege to be here and speak about uh, grooming and self-care practices for, he says for college men, but for human beings, period. I think it's important. Uh, what I have to say is important for everybody that's human. <laughs> so, um, and it will include men as well. So uh, just for clarity, hygiene, conditions or practices conducive to maintaining health and preventing diseases, especially through cleanliness. So when we're talking about grooming and hygiene, we're gonna be talking about exactly what that's about. One of the things I like to say to people is our temple or our physical body, there's nothing more important than maintaining our temple. Everything that we want to do requires a functioning temple, a functioning body. So anything that we feel is important to us outside of our physical bodies, it is no good to us if our physical body 
is not properly maintained and in order so that we can function in these other areas and do all of these other things that we think are important. But we should never, never take this temple and this body for granted because without it, we can't do any of these other things that we really think are important. Okay, so there's nothing more important than the maintenance of our temple. Um, and we need this body to navigate reality. Without it, nothing else matters. Even the, the brilliant, brilliant scientist, uh, Stephen Hawkins, you familiar with him? Stephen Hawkins, his, his physical body failed him to a major degree, to the point that his, his brain was still functioning better than most other human beings. And he was able to communicate through technology and the computer. And he was able to share his thoughts and his theories and his ideas through uh, the computer. So, but he wouldn't have been able to do that without his physical body. He was still able to get something out of it that was productive. You understand what I'm saying? So we, we have to keep in mind it's not cool to take this body for granted. Now, I'm going to be talking about three forms of grooming and hygiene. Mental grooming and hygiene, physical grooming and hygiene, and emotional grooming and hygiene. Many of us think about grooming and hygiene and just physically, you know, wash your underarms. For those of you, us who use deodorant, you know, use some deodorant, brush your teeth and stuff. But today I want to talk about mental, physical, and emotional grooming and hygiene. So first, let's deal with the mental part. As it relates to our ability to, 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 to get things done, to use this body, to do the things that we think are important, there's nothing more important than this physical and maintain, maintaining it. Now, when it comes to mental grooming and hygiene, on that side, there is nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. How we feel about ourselves will, de will determine our success in any endeavor, how far we go in life, how much we'll achieve in life, and how much, how disappointed we'll be in life. It all starts and ends with how we feel about ourselves. So from a mental hygiene standpoint, we have to always keep in mind how important it is to feel good about ourselves, especially in a society that's constantly trying to control us and tell us how we should feel about ourselves. And, you know, the, this media is powerful and it will have us moving in certain directions and feeling certain ways about ourselves and our situations in a moment's notice if we don't stay on top of it. It's, 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 it's a challenge to continue on a daily basis to feel great about ourselves. Mistakes are a natural part of living. No person can live without challenges. And sometimes when these challenges come, we make decisions. And the quality of our decisions determine how well we move through these challenges. But we can't live in fear of making mistakes because that's where the learning curve truly takes place. When we make mistakes, the mistakes offer us the opportunity to examine what went wrong, learn from it, and then take whatever we were trying to get done to next levels of understanding. So mental grooming and hygiene includes the significance and importance of how we feel about ourselves. One of the things I say all the time, and then I say in this book that I'm working on now, is that 
the mind is like a fingerprint. Everybody understands that every fingerprint is unique, right? Well, the mind is the same thing. To be quite honest with ourselves in this reality we live in, if we truly understood that the mind is like a fingerprint, we would kind of expect people to think differently than we do. If we truly understood that. But because of our conditioning and how we think, many of us, you know, are offended and appalled. How can you not see it the way I see it? <laughs> and that's an unreasonable thought. When we understand that our mind is like a fingerprint. is very unique. Each mind is unique in its own way. So when somebody does something and we look around and we start talking about how we would have done it, that's cool. But as soon as we feel like they should have done it the way we think they should have, now we're moving away from the understanding that the mind is like a fingerprint. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Okay, that's cool. cool. So mental grooming and hygiene, nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. Understanding the mind is like a fingerprint. And personal discipline. Mentally, in order to have success in life, we have to have a major degree of discipline. When I went to college, <laughs> one of my biggest challenges is I never studied in high school, ever. You know, I, I was able to get through stuff and get things done. So, and, and, and the reality of my life and family at the time, there was nobody encouraging study habits. You know, hey, right after school, while fresh in your mind, sit down for a couple of hours, you know, and especially anything associated with math and science, you have to stay on top of it because it's like learning a language. If you don't stay on top of it, you miss one day, you go in there the next day and it's like, you don't know what's going on. The biggest challenge is statistics, biology, well, chemistry, uh, and math, all of these things start out so easy, we get lax. But these are things you have to stay on top of. And I'm talking about hygiene in general, but I'm also talking about the discipline associated with, you know, whatever it is we're trying to focus on. You know, we have to stay on top of it. We have to stay on top of it. We have to have discipline with time. We live in the video game age and the social media age. And let me tell you, man, that TikTok, you can sit down and start watching videos and blast through five hours. Mm -hmm without even being aware. So it requires extra discipline now. Like there's so many things that can dist distract you from studying. Um, when, when I was in college, we had distractions, but I, I, I could never say the same. With the technology that we have today that's available for people, <laughs> Man, I know you have to really work hard to get things done and get this degree and get through this, this process. But you know what I'm saying when I say you need some serious discipline. Discipline, and that's a part of mental movement and hygiene. So we talk about there's nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. The mind is a fingerprint, and if we truly understand that, if everyone in here truly understood that the mind is like a fingerprint, then I couldn't imagine any one of you getting into any kind of arguments after today. That's if you really understand that. Because you move from trying to be correct and the one who's right and the one who wins to trying to understand. See, when you truly understand the mind is like a fingerprint, the goal is to understand now. And if you don't understand, that's cool. Like if somebody explains it to you, oh, this is why I feel this way. Be okay with not understanding. 
if you truly understand the mind of the thing first. Because not one of us can know all of the things that led up to our mind and what it's like for us in here today. And it's unreasonable for any one of us to expect any other of us to just think like we do. Because I feel like what I'm saying makes more sense. It's okay if we don't understand each other. So that is uh, what I call the uh, mental grooming and hygiene. And we'll talk about the traditional physical grooming and hygiene. Go from the top to the bottom. You know, we start with our hair. In the barber shop, in the hair salon, I've dealt with men, grown men, professional men, who come in with all matter of stuff caked on your scalp. And I've always wondered, how do you get in the shower every day and just not put your head under shower shampoo? Mm -hmm. you, you, the hair is short, okay? Now, my hair is to the back of my knee, <laughs> so it's a whole different story. But when you have short hair, how do you not put your head under the shower and shampoo it, you know, condition it, and come on out? But that's a real part of this existence we're in. There are people who genuinely don't put their head under the shower for whatever reason. It's real. So, you know, we have to take care of our take care of our hair. And men, understand it's okay to use conditioner. That's just not a woman's thing. Conditioner helps keep your hair from being just hard and brittle and breaking when you comb it. Even for men who grow hair on their faces, they grow beards or whatever. When you're in the shower, it's okay to condition that hair on your face. So when it's dry and you comb through it, if you, especially if you want it to grow, you're not just breaking it off. So conditioner is not just a female thing. <laughs> you know, it's good for men to use conditioner as well to keep your hair from being dry and hard and brittle. Are y'all with me? Yeah. All right. Moving on down. The nose. When you're in the shower, that's a good time to get that cleaned out pretty good. You know, I mean, it really is. You know, you hold your head up and soften things up and go ahead and blow it out and clean it out. And get the nose together in the shower. Um, that's a great place to do it. <laughs> that's a great place to do it. And we, we, we have some obvious understanding when it comes to the mouth, you know. Um, I, I have had a client, I had a client one time, and he had a breath issue. And I mean, you know, it's breath issues happen for different reasons. It could be something deeply rooted. It could be something, maybe you just don't brush your teeth. It could be, you could have some kind of gum disease. There's a lot of different reasons to have breath issues. And, and this particular brother had some serious. It got to the point where if I would see him at the door, my body would have a <laughs> physiological reaction. Like I would look. And I finally had to pull him to the side and say, my man, I can't do it anymore. If you, I, you've grown. You can brush your teeth or something. You can, that, that's not necessary when I'm smelling. And I had to say it because I was having a physical reaction to just the sight of him showing up to get his, his uh, hair done. So we have to take care of the mouth and the body in general. You know, you got to wash that up good. We're talking about grooming and self care practices for human beings. And uh, 
right now we're talking about the box. Everybody knows there's significant places and areas that need a little extra work. You know, one of the things that um, I was in college when somebody told me about this, and I have to be honest, I it, I never thought about it until somebody mentioned this to me. They said, I don't understand how a person used the same washcloth for their body that they do for their face. Listen, I never thought about it. Ever since that day, I've always had two. One for my face and one for my body. We don't have, nobody got to raise their hands, but I'm sure somebody just discovered today that that is not sexy. <laughs> so I'm just putting that out there so somebody can get it the way I got it. It's, once you hear it, it makes sense, right? So nobody got to raise their hand or nothing, but um, how we eat. Um, based, based on some of the things I've learned, I'm not a, this health expert. I'm not a vegan or vegetarian. Um, I, I don't, well, the only meat I really eat is I eat fish. And Pescatarian? Cow. Huh? Pescatarian? That's I'm, I'm not sure. You think maybe that's what it is? Yeah. But, I, but what I was going to say is I'm not sure if I'm still that. <laughs> I'll eat organic chicken, mm -hmm. but um, regular chicken, that's, that's totally out. You know, I mean, they, do, do you realize that chicken has um, more sodium in it than, than any other meat that comes out of the market? Mm -hmm. And that's before you put any on it. And the reason why is because that solution they injected with it to swell the meat up and make it look big and tough. So anyway, that's something I learned in the video. <laughs> so uh, just passing it along, just like the two wash cloths, two, two cloths. So uh, yeah, so um, organic chicken and fish, as far as meat consumption is concerned. But I think it's important. And then I have some serious challenges. Chips Ahoy's Oreo cookies, Lay's kettle cooked potato chips. Ah. <laughs> You, I don't have enough peanuts. There's a whole variety of them. Um, back from New York. Too. This is the, and I was just about to name my third issue. I got the Chips Ahoy's chocolate chips. I got the Kettle Cook Lay's potato chips. And I have the m &Rs with peanuts with Junior Mints. I have to eat them together. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> but anyway. You have mint flavor m &Rs. I'm not messing with you. <laughs> I already have enough problems. I already have enough problems. I'm not trying. I'm not doing nothing new. I'm stumbling with my three issues. So, you know, we have to do better with how we eat because I think the primary source for most diseases is how we eat. And there's no lecture needed on that. We know that. And I'll tell you one habit that I do have is every night, the last thing I do before I go to bed, I drink 20 ounces of water. And every morning, the first thing I do when I get up is I drink 20 ounces of water. And um, what I've noticed for me is that when I get up in the morning, every morning, I just have a nice flow and I feel like my kidneys are being cleaned and refreshed and it's just really cool. It's not sexy to get up and just have this little weak stream. <laughs> I'm addicted to that flow now. So I don't, I don't lay down without drinking that 20 ounces of water every night because I like how it feels in the morning when I just feel like I've been flushed every night. You know? So. Um, and so that is what I call the physical grooming and hygiene associated with the body. And so now I'm going to talk about, um, for those who just got here, I was talking about grooming and self-care practices for human beings. 
and I talked about mental grooming and hygiene, physical grooming and hygiene, and now I'm gonna talk about emotional grooming and hygiene, it's very important. Emotional grooming and hygiene starts with self-respect, self-love, and self-responsibility. Now, if we truly understand those three things, especially after I finish, then we will never leave here and blame somebody for how they feel. However, it takes time to get to that point. But I am saying that when we truly understand it from the inside out, self-love, self-respect, and self-responsibility, we do not blame others for making me feel a certain way. We do not blame others for triggering us. This is the latest language that's used a lot. Um, they know my triggers. I apologize for triggering you. I, you, I um, have learned that life is so much more beautiful when I make myself responsible for how I feel. Life cruises along so much better. Because when we put that in someone else's hands, they own us at that time. And if we put it in the wrong person's hands, then they can decide to own us whenever they want. So it's so much better when we take responsibility for ourselves and how we feel. Um, and uh, have some control over our emotions. Anybody got their cell phone with them? Just send me. Go to Google. And some people come up with different things, but I need a few people to do it because so we can get what I'm looking for out of this. Type in argument leads to, and then hit return. And look at the result. What, what do you get? Say some of the things. Water shooting. Yeah. Shooting. Yeah. 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 I can dig it. So some of y'all got that list that talks about tragedies, right? And so when we engage ourselves in arguments and then emotions take over and nobody takes control over the emotion, then we're playing Russian roulette. Because I can guarantee you all of those people in that list, they had no idea those things were going to happen. They had no idea just from an argument that somebody's gonna get shot or stabbed or traumatized. Nobody really knew that. So I'm gonna tell you this story so to help help us understand how how this adrenaline works, especially when we get emotional. Adrenaline is a universal standard. Adrenaline is what, what makes us feel good, and adrenaline is what makes us feel bad. But the difference is, we can only feel good and really excited and yay for a limited period of time. You know, you just can't stay happy with adrenaline for an extended period of time. It kind of mellows you back out you know, after a while. Whereas negative emotions that are rooted in adrenaline flow can last forever. For some people it lasts for years and it leads to, you know, what they call depression and any number of other things that follow that. So I was at the movie theater. And I was, it was, it was, uh, what was it, the Marvel movie, you know? It's a Marvel movie, and I dig sci-fi, and I dig Marvel movies and stuff, so 
I'm, I'm sitting in the back, man. I got my whole setup and everything, my m and and junior mints, and you know, and I'm, I'm ready to roll. So, but there were these young kids who were sitting right next to me who were making so much noise. They were so excited. They just couldn't contain themselves, you know. And, and, and I was like, I don't know. I think I'm going to have to move, man, you know, because I'll be serious about my movies. Like, I'm not good with people who want to talk to me during the movie. Talk during the movie. So, anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there ready and I'm, I'm trying to make a decision about whether I should move or not. You know, this is serious business here for me. So, <laughs> my phone rang. Right when my phone rang, the movie was starting. They had just finished the preview. And it was a young cousin of mine who who was a scholarship basketball player at one of these universities, and he was having some kind of challenge, and I always told him to call me anytime. So he called me, and I, and I said, hello. He was like, hey, this is Thomas, and um, he was telling me something. He just went right into it. I couldn't say, man, I'm at the movies. Because when he, when, when he calls me, it's for, he, doesn't call, he doesn't make frivolous calls. To me. So I knew it was something he needed to do. So I figured if I can listen, I might be able to get through this phone call and then get off, you know. So he's talking to me and, he, and he, he, he's asking me and I'm, I'm like, okay, so this is what you need to do. And I know I'm out of order. I'm out of order. I am out of order. And a gentleman right here to the left in the front says, hey, you're not supposed to be talking in the movie. And I know how he feels because I was just tripping about these kids. And I knew I was wrong, so I didn't say anything. I said, okay. You know, and I'm trying to get off the phone. So now he's turning around looking at me, and he doesn't necessarily hear me saying anything. I'm on the phone. Now that's bothering him. Hey, you're not supposed to be on the phone in the movie theater. So I said, um, I didn't say anything. Sometimes when you're wrong, it's just best to not say nothing. No, I'm not going to argue with this man. So my cousin is still, he's not ready to hang up. He's still going, and I'm trying to be smooth and transition this thing off the phone. So I have to say something. And the man came and stood up in front of me. He said, you're not supposed to be on the phone in the movie theater. Now he's making a whole scene. So then I'm like, okay, you know what? These kids irritated him too. But now I'm the person who, this is, this is how I was thinking. He's putting this on me now. So I still said nothing. And my cousin was like, who is that? I said, well, I'm in the movie theater. He said, oh, you're in the movie theater? I can call you back. I said, well, I just wanted to make sure you were okay. And when I said that, he raised his arms up and slammed them down on my legs. You're not supposed to be talking on the phone in the movie. I mean, he slammed his arms yeah. on my legs. And a rest. I told my cousin, hey, man, I, I'm going to talk to you. And I hung the phone up. And now my heart is just beating like crazy. And this adrenaline, you know, adrenaline comes so fast. I, now I got all of this adrenaline in me and I don't know what to do with myself. And I'm sitting there and I got off the phone and when he saw me get off the phone, he turned around and stood in front of me and blocked the screen. Right there. And I'm sitting, I'm way in the back seat against the wall. And I'm sitting there and this adrenaline is instigating. It's like, yo, you need to do something. <laughs> and I'm saying... I was wrong. I shouldn't have been on the phone. I'm going to just try to get through this and calm down so I can watch the movie. So that's what I decided to try to do. But the more he just chose to stand there in front of me, now he's just literally blocking my view. The movie is going. I'm off the phone. So the adrenaline is like, listen, you need to do something, bro. 
And after literally five minutes, it's a five minute standoff, I'm sitting here. And he quietly just goes and sits down because I never said anything to him. But I can't stop this adrenaline, man. It's just, so I, adrenaline is like, you gotta do something. You gotta do something. So I leaned down like I was behind him and I said, listen, don't you ever touch me again. And he said, you know, I know I was wrong. I know I was wrong. I know I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. I, I was just angry. I know I was wrong. Now, he didn't know what I was. He was sitting there not knowing what I was going to do. Adrenaline was like, that's not enough. So I leaned back down and I said, if you ever touch me again. And he's like, I know I was wrong. I said, listen, my phone might ring again. <laughs> and if you ever touch me again, I will bash your head through the back of this wall. And then I sat back down. Adrenaline. Adrenaline was like, you ain't even cussed, man. That wasn't enough. And I'm saying to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing this whole thing. And, and he is an older man, older than me. And I'm saying, if I do anything to him, like when he was standing there, I was like, can you imagine? I'm way in the back, and he's standing there with his back to me, blocking the movie. Like, if I pushed him, and you know how those roads go down, he could have got really hurt, broken ribs, all kinds of stuff. And, and no matter what I said happened, the fact that he slammed his fists on my legs, I would have been the villain. I, I would have been the villain, period. So I'm sitting back here, and my chest is still banging, and I'm trying to watch the movie, and this is just not working. So I said, you know what? I'm going to have to come back another time to see this movie because I can't keep sitting here and I don't want to put myself in a bad situation. And this adrenaline won't stop. This adrenaline will not stop. I gathered up my things. I left the movie theater. Do you know by the time I got to my car, my body and everything was back to normal? That adrenaline literally stopped. When I took myself out of that situation, my body was in fight or flight. And it was not going to leave that space until I left the area. And that's what I learned. Because now I'm at the car and I'm standing here amazed because I feel normal. And I said, that's how effective that was? All I had to do was leave the environment and it, my body just responded just, just as fast as the adrenaline started flowing. It stopped as soon as I got outside and away from the so-called threat. And so now I'm thinking, when I leaned down, that guy could have stabbed me in the face or even shot me. And he would have been right from everybody else. Because now I'm leaning down, threatening him. And he could have stabbed me or shot me, and guess what? I'd have been wrong and stabbed or shot. Now I'm thinking about all of these things that could have happened or what, what may have been the reason why he had enough courage to think he could lay hands on me. So I tell that story to say that it's so important for us to be consciously able to determine how we feel in certain situations and when we can't control it and we find ourselves feeling this way, when I tell you leaving the environment completely works, it, it, it really works. Your body has a full physiological response to being out of danger. The same, just as intense as the 
responses when we are in danger and that adrenaline starts flowing. And just as quick as it happens, when we remove ourselves from that situation, our body responds the exact same way, just as quick. It was amazing. So I hope that um, you could grab something from that story. And this, there's this interesting thing I learned about adrenaline. You hear about people doing things, horrible things like stabbing somebody 30 times and you, and, and you or shooting, so keep shooting somebody. You know, I always wonder, well, okay, they, they were done. Why did they keep going? You ever thought about that? Why did they keep going? And what I realized in that situation is that adrenaline makes you high. And the more you use it, the higher you get. It almost feels good. It, no, it does feel good. When you start using that adrenaline that's flowing, it takes you higher. It feels good. And it, it, it makes you want to keep using it. And it won't stop until you do. It'll give you as much adrenaline as you want and take you high as you want to go. And that's why some people, once when they lose it, it's hard for them to calm down because you unconsciously feel higher as you use the adrenaline. I mean, and that is the experience I had. But my mind, you know, I felt better when I threatened them. Okay, whew, all right. But the adrenaline was coming so hard and heavy, that wasn't enough. And I realized the best thing I could have done was leave, the, completely leave the environment. But I, I didn't realize how significant that was until I actually got outside and felt the effect and how it worked. So hygiene, grooming and self-care practices. I talked about mental grooming and hygiene, uh, how there's Nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. I talked about our temple and physical body and how no matter what you think is important, if we don't take care of this body, none of it matters. Um, talked about physical grooming and hygiene and emotional grooming and hygiene. Um, we have to truly, truly learn to love ourselves, take responsibility for ourselves and not compromise our self-respect. One of the last things I wanted to say as it relates to mental uh, grooming and hygiene is, you know when you're compromising your self-respect, when you accept something that you don't like for an extended period of time. Because after a while, when you're compromising your self-respect, first you're uncomfortable, then you become resentful then you become angry. And then if nothing is done by you, he changes the situation. You can slide into depression and we don't know how long that's gonna hang around or where that's gonna go. But compromising our self-respect is not healthy. We've all done it. I know I have, but it's not good. And we have to recognize when that is happening so we can craft a plan execute a plan to get on with life. And I want to say something about anger. You can challenge me on this. You can think about it. And you can think about every time you've ever been angry and every time you think you might get angry after today. 100% of the time, we are angry. It's because we are in denial about a reality that we don't there is a reality before us that we don't like and we don't want it accepted. So we get angry about it. And what I suggest is that rather than being in denial about the reality, accept it. Some people say, oh, I'm just supposed to accept such and such and thus and forth. Accept the reality for whatever it is. craft a plan for dealing with that reality based on what it is. Because what 
prevents us from doing this is we hang out in the world of should be, supposed to be, we were friends, best friend, all of that unrealistic stuff. Anytime we start talking about should, could, supposed to, woulda, that's not reality. And that is us putting ourselves in a position to be angry. Well, they were my best friend. I can tell you that 100% of the time, whoever your best friend is, when it comes down to it, they're gonna do what's in their own best interest before what's in your best interest. And that's why best friends have the ugliest breakups. Because whenever that best friend decides to do what's in their best interest first, it's always inconvenient. Always inconvenient <laughs> for the friend who wanted them to do something different. And so, It's, it's, it's just, it's very important to understand when we're angry, identify the reality, accept it. And okay, now based on what this reality is, this is the plan that I'm gonna come up with to deal with this reality. Execute the plan, you know what life. Emotional greeting and hygiene. So, um, that's it. That's what I wanted to deal with today as far as dealing with the mental grooming and hygiene, grooming and self practices for human beings. And uh, I hope that I gave you something you can work with. And I absolutely love questions. I'm not a person who pushes away from questions. And so if you have any questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I noticed that in, in emotional states too, when like, because uh, uh, when we eat, we'll affect our gut health, the gut health affecting our emotions. Um, what would you suggest? So a diet is just giving us to, to, to help our emotions? Because like it, if, if I'm not feeling right, then I'm obviously not going to take care of myself, and I'm not going to, to want to brush my hair as often as I do or, or, or clean up my... Well, work backwards. When you feel a certain way, the first thing to think about is what did what did you eat recently? You know, and then start monitoring whatever that was. Work work backwards. Um, because I'm a person I've done a water and juice fast for thirty days, just juice and water. Just have my juicer, juice and carrots, juice and kale, juice and all kind of stuff, and water for thirty days. I absolutely love that feeling of fasting because man, your mind is just so clear. And, 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 and you hear people say it, but it's true. You just become so much more sharp. And I realize that um, how we eat affects how we think and affects how we feel and affects how we move 100% of the time. Why do you think that is? Like, like is it, does it have to do with the chemicals in the food or like how it reacts with them? Because it has something to do with what's in the food. Okay. This is why many people always suggest that even if you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something, it's just better than eating just a bunch of processed food from the restaurants and all that kind of stuff. Because they just have so much. Right now, the kind of stuff they're putting in the food to make it last a long time, we have no idea how that's jacking us up, man. I still don't trust apples <laughs> that don't turn brown. I don't know what they're using, man, but they got these apples that don't turn brown. <laughs> so, no, the butter is rotten. I'm very concerned. Oh or so, or bread that doesn't mold. Right. It just sits there forever. Right, right. McDonald's. So, yeah, so, um, well, one thing I have to give McDonald's credit really? is that if you don't eat their fries in time, they will turn to little wooden sticks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you know that I mean, that they, you, the air starts moving out of them and they start yeah. seeping in and, and, you know, and, you know, they turn, you cannot eat them. <laughs> so I give them credit. You know, they will not hang in there, but food affects how we think. And all we have to do, it's just a matter of monitoring ourselves. Monitoring ourselves. I remember, I'm older, right? I'm 61. So I, um, I, I hadn't had, what do you call them? Oreo cookies in years. Years I hadn't had Oreo cookies in years. 
And I was, one day I was at the laundromat and I, you know, I was like, oh, you got to try the Oreo cookies. I haven't had them in a long time. I ate those Oreo cookies. And my fingers turned into little sausages. And my ankles were swollen. I said, what the hell is in these cookies? <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that people who eat them all the time, they get used to their body being like that all the time. So it doesn't seem abnormal. But for me, and the fact that I hadn't, it just, I hadn't eaten nothing like that in a long time, my body had a serious reaction. And some of us, older people really look like shiny swollen sausages because of years and years and years of eating foul stuff like i i try to fast once a year that's when i was doing the 28 day 30 fat 30 day fast just to give my body a break just to give my body a chance to gather itself you know i'm i'm not a person i've never been a smoker I don't smoke weed. I never smoke cigarettes. Gotten into most of cigarettes. I don't drink alcohol, beer, wine, champagne. Never got into it. Didn't start and stop because of anything. Never got involved in any of that stuff. Any getting high in any way, form, or fashion. So now that I've started paying attention to my body after I eat certain things, I can tell when something is out of order. Like you know, and and it's, it's the same with you. You know, you're a lot younger. Right now is a great time to start paying attention to your body after you consume certain things. And then you, you'll, start, you'll start saying, oh wow, okay, I, I didn't notice this. You know, you, you look at your hands, like you see these little lines in my fingers? Man, I ate them Oreo cookies, man, it wasn't no lines, it was just smooth and shiny. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I don't know what that was, but that's the end of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, it has everything to do with us paying attention to ourselves, paying attention to our bodies, and having some self-respect, you know, self-love, taking care of ourselves in that way. Um, any, any more questions? Yes, sir. So I like what you said about the adrenaline and the anger. I've noticed myself every, sing every single time I might get a little bit of a pump of adrenaline and I know something's going to happen, I try to relax myself. Specifically with that anger part, it gets kind of crazy. So, I have a question for you. Are, are you up to uh, current things in the world with what happened at the Oscars? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, what, what Will Smith did, was that out of anger, straight adrenaline, just... Okay, so, what I like to say is the only thing any one of us outside Will Smith's mind can do is speculate. It's all we can do. We can say, oh, she wasn't really threatened. He didn't have to protect her in that way. She wasn't physically threatened. That's when we're not respecting the fact that the mind is like a fingerprint. We all handle things different ways. And so when I look at that, I look at, because I'm literally writing a book on harmonious and productive communication. So all of these things, you know, this is exciting for me. Whatever you study, if something happened in the world, if you were studying rocket science and all of a sudden somebody had a rocket taken off the water, I mean, whatever you're into and you see it happening, you get excited about it. You, it's something that you're into, that you're thinking about every day. I think about communication and how we interact with each other every day, all day. That's, what I, that's what's on my mind. So when I saw that situation, I was kind of excited because I, I knew it was going to be a lot of perspectives and opinions. And I also realized that everybody is an, ex is an expert on how everybody else should live. Everybody is an expert on how everybody else and so from a philosophical place, from the fact that I'm writing a book about harmonious and productive communication, if somebody was to say, well, how do you think that situation could have best been handled? Um, and I'm not trying to be in Will's mind, but now I'm coming from my mind saying how I think it could have been best handled. 
if the goal is harmonious and productive communication. I personally believe that first of all, we have to take responsibility for our own feelings and emotions. Like we can't let somebody say something. I have a deck of conversation cards that I created that I'm gonna give away today. They deal with sex, money, religion, and relationships. I go right for the gusto. I, we ask them questions about whatever. And one of the questions in this deck of cards was, if we were in a club and somebody tweaked your partner's butt, how would you handle it? Now, I got cussed out in the hair salon all the time. Because I would say, we got three options, but I'm coming from a, a, a place of controlling me, because I can't control nobody else. I said, well, we have three options. We can go to the owner and have him removed. We can call the police and have him charged and removed. Or we can leave. But I'm not jumping in that man's face. He clearly has nothing to lose. He clearly wants a problem. He clearly has more energy for negativity and hostility than I do. So I'm not putting my life on the line for a butt tweak. I'm just not. But a lot of men and women feel like you're not protecting your woman. That's not cool. And I'm like, I'm living in an extremely hostile world. And I have to make choices that make sense for my life, not these instant emotional choices. And for a woman that's with me and she feels like I'm supposed to jump in that man's face, she probably gonna cut me off and that's cool. Cause I'm not losing my life about a butt tweak. I'm just not, you know, that's just a choice that I'm making. It's not happening. Now, if you, which is a lot, what a lot of women do. If you, as a woman who's with me, go jump in that man's face. <laughs> now. <laughs> now I'm in a situation. Now nah, he slapped you down. Now nah, I gotta go over there and get knocked out too. Now nah, we both laying around on the ground. Because we didn't have the energy they have. We're talking about odds. We're talking about uh, percentages, you know, probability and statistics. The probability that he has way more hostility built up than you and I do. We're holding hands, we're walking, we're feeling good. So if we come at them with the energy we have, it's a high probability it's not gonna work out for. <laughs> So now you get knocked out, then I gotta go run over there, and then I get knocked out, then we both laying around her. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of like how my mind works. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the most peaceful way and productive way for me to remove myself from the situation. So if that, for me, if that had been so insulting and damaging and whatever, I would have my woman and I would have got up and just left. Because that's what we can control. I can't control that man's mouth. What if he had decided, because I posted stuff and the man with the mic got the power. What, and, and he's a comedian? What if he had <laughs> took the power he had with that mic and went to work? Mm -hmm. So what, what are you gonna do now? You just gonna go into a whole brawl? How, how do you, what do you do? So, so I, I um, yeah, my woman and I would have got up and just left. I have a question about that. If, if you went to the club for, sorry, uh, it's just on that same topic. If you went to the club to be there and have fun, say that happened at the beginning of the night, and you just like up and left, I don't, like, it's hard for me to see the side of like, wouldn't he be the one who should leave? Because you're there to have fun, and you don't want him to ruin your good time. I love that question. Because it's a lesson in understanding we can only control us. I can't control him. Yeah. I'm not gonna battle him 
over him preventing me from having fun. So you're not gonna stay there and continue to kind of escalate the situation? Oh no, man, I got you. because I have control over me. I don't have control over him. I don't have control over anybody. And most of us, you know, just like I was talking about the best friends thing earlier, we have these expectations of people. And we're talking about mental and emotional bullying and hygiene right now. But we have these expectations of people. And when they don't meet our expectations, we trip, especially if they are so-called friends. But you can't be disappointed unless you have expectations. Now, if they don't meet your expectations, then we have to know how to move through that and keep it and, and accept that reality make a plan for how to deal with that reality and get on with life, execute the plan and get on with life. So I can't expect anything from him. You know, I'm not gonna get in the bad, you ain't gonna ruin my fun. Yeah. How much fun is that, <laughs> you know? Yes, sir. No, I was gonna say, off the, off the, your response was, uh, your question was confused. I was, I was watching a, a, a stand-up show with uh, Kevin, Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, life, life, life. And that's a reaction. That's definitely everything is a reaction. Everybody controls their own reaction. So as you were saying, it's, and when we don't like maybe the reaction of another because of how people are quick to, to look at another's appearance and, and suggest, uh, you know, things that they should uh, try to do. Like, oh, maybe, maybe your hair would look nicer if you twisted it more often. So when it comes to, so that's changing our reality, but shouldn't we not change our reality just because of what another person thinks, even if it has anything to do with like ruling? We'll see if it's a reaction to the other person, they own you. The decision you make just has to simply be yours, independent of how somebody thinks about it. The reaction is what establishes ownership. <laughs> so. When we respond, we allow ourselves to be owned and controlled. You know, and, and that's just real. We have to self-love, self-respect, self-responsibility. Own it and move, move through life with it. It's a, uh, it's a really cool way to move through life, especially when you know that you have the opportunity to control you in any situation. And sometimes, if you get caught off guard, like when you begin practicing this, if you get caught off guard, you'll recover real fast, you know. The, the, the more you practice owning yourself, the quicker you'll recover when certain things happen that you might get ready to have them uh, just just what makes, I can tell you, what made me write this book that I'm writing is 20 years ago, I, I was very angry. I wasn't angry through high school, but it was college that started angry because I started reading about our history. And the more I read about our history, the more heated I got. And then... You know, I started listening and following Minister Farrakhan and then a brother named Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, who actually said, if you black in America and you not angry, something wrong with you. And I took on that philosophy. And so I would read and read and study and study just so when I went into these artistic circles and these conversations, 
I felt like it was my responsibility to verbally remove your head from your shoulders if you said something that I didn't agree with or that I thought didn't make sense. And then one day, so this was my reputation. And then one day, there are a few incidents that happened, but this is one of the key things that put me on the path, this journey to, to where I am now and to writing the book that I'm writing. There was a party and there were artists in the room and I, you know, I was heavy into poetry at the time. And there was an artist, all kind of artists. They were musicians, and painters, and everybody, all kind of artists at this party. And there was a big discussion going on in the kitchen. I was like, oh, we can go on in there and see what's going on. And this is the absolute truth. When I walked in the kitchen, like 75% of the people in the kitchen just left. They just stopped talking and bounced. And my feelings were like so hurt, like, cause I knew they left because of me. <laughs> Nobody was in the mood for me and my <laughs> foolishness. And they just left, like. But who I was, I was so entrenched in it even though my feelings hurt for a minute and I was delayed for a moment, when you're a person like me, it's always somebody who's like, nah, he ain't gonna intimidate me. Or he not gonna make me this or that, you know? And so it was one of them kind of guys in the kitchen. And he decided he wanted to challenge me. And next thing you know, people holding him, veins popping out his neck, he all bent out of shape. Cause I didn't have to yell and scream. I would just, verbally dismantle you calmly. And it seems like that makes people even more upset. So, <laughs> but I thought about that and, and the woman who had the party said, Alfonso, you know, you gotta do something about that. You know, you, you really need to work on that. And But I had already made that decision. And so then I started adjusting my approach because I wanted to be heard. I didn't want people to just, here he go. I wanted to literally be heard and I thought I had some things to say that people could genuinely learn from. So that was the beginning 20 years ago was, was the, uh, the beginning of the journey to this book that I'm working on today. Yeah. Uh, I thought, um, so during that time span, was that also when you were in college for cosmetology? And yeah, this was, yeah, after cosmetology. That was after? Ah, oh, so the people that you met during that time period, how they carried over afterwards? During, well, see, when I, I was, no, when I started in cosmetology, 1990 or so, yeah, I was at the, I was, I was at the upswing of anger. By 1998, 1999, I was at the peak of anger. And then, as I started working on me and taking responsibility of myself, by 2006 or seven, I started reading more than just file history and stuff and started reading about the human body and the mind and self-responsibility and all these things. And so that's, you know. But no, I, in cosmetology, Remember when Princess Diana passed away? Y'all remember that? Y'all old enough to remember that? <laughs> Some of y'all wasn't born. Y'all didn't know. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Princess Diana, uh, yeah. she, Princess Diana passed away, right? But about, I don't know, maybe a month before that, Malcolm X's former wife, Betty Shabazz, passed away. So in the salon where I was working at, you know, everybody knew I was angry revolutionary mess. But I was really good at what I did, so they just kind of put up with me. And at the time, I had a lot of West Indian customers. And so I used to go in the salon at 6 o'clock a.m. on Saturday. And my customers were like, we want to watch the funeral. I said, we ain't watching no 
Princess Diana funeral in here just because she held up a black baby and took a picture of y'all in here trying to watch her funeral. And, and it was a lot of island customers I had at the time. And I was like, no, nah, we ain't watching no Princess Diana funeral. Y'all didn't say nothing when Betty Chappaz died a month ago. You ain't say nothing about watching her funeral, you know. It's, you know, I thought I was a revolutionary at the time. Angry. Do you know I, all my island customers quit me and I had to almost restart all over again? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I gotta do something about this. This is not working out for me, you know? And uh, So there were different incidents that helped me begin to look at myself and adjust myself as opposed to getting angry with the world for not accepting me. You know, people don't have to accept you at all. And um, if you want to be in the space with people and be heard and communicate, you have to, you know, be willing to make some adjustments if you want to be around other human beings. It requires adjustments. Any other questions? There was a, a question over here about Bonzo. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to ask a while ago. I forgot. Um, hypothetical, right? Mm -hmm. You walk in. Your girl, your best friend. How do you, in that moment, take like control of your own? Like, how do you not get mad? I love at that question. So crazy, like that. beautiful question. Beautiful question. Have you ever heard "crime of passion"? Well, what happens is a lot of us don't understand that a lot of these things they call crimes of passion were actually are actually crimes of planning. How many times have you? been around somebody, especially since you asked that question, and they said, man, shoot, if I ever walked in my girl and she was with my boy, boy or something like that, and you go ahead and start telling your story about what you would do, you're programming your mind. You hear about some people, they say, I blacked out, I don't know what happened. A lot of times, the blackout is actually your body taking over because you've been programming your mind to react this way for an extended period of time, consciously and unconsciously. So right now, since you brought that up, I move it in my mind to say, she has no interest in being with me any longer. And I gotta bounce. That is the reaction that I want to have. So that's the reaction that I plant, that's the seed that I plant in my mind. So if something like that actually does happen and my body takes over, then I'm leaving because that's the seed I planted. And so what I'm saying is if when we have these kind of concerns about our reactions to certain situations, we can plant the seed so that we respond a certain way. It's no different than when athletes and gymnasts in particular, they envision themselves going through their routine over and over and over again. And so by the time the music hits, they're not thinking anymore. Their body takes over. That programming is real and it works and it's extremely effective. And we can use it in so many ways for, to help ourselves in life and how it works. And so that's what I would suggest. I would suggest that if you feel that there was a concern, like you put it out there in the universe, that that's something that you thought about. So since you put it out there, then start programming your response to it. That's similar to manifestation. Seems like it's in the same thing as manifestation. Yeah, it's, it's in the same family. It's in the same family. We didn't talk about that last week, man. It seems, seems very similar. It's in the same family, but Yeah. Obviously, manifestation is a little deeper than that. Yeah. I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it's more programming. I apologize. No, you're fine. Um, I understand, like, well, from my perspective, I, I could say, like, in the beginning of a relationship, you, I, I would program myself to be like, okay, maybe if that happens in the beginning, that person won't want to be with me, and I'll just move on because, you know, it's just fresh. But how, how would you? Great question. Start working on that now. <laughs> <laughs>
No, I'm, I'm very serious. Start working on that now. So if that happens to happen, you have a, a response that is your choice, not your emotions choice. Because when I said Google argued at least two, that's what happens when the emotions make the choice. All of those tragedies. That makes sense? Who? Cool. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know what you think of the good looking as far as um, debating with people or having conversations. Like, what made them so, like, they didn't want to hear what you had to say? Because I tried to rip their heads off with the information. Each and every person? Everybody. Mm. Nobody move, nobody get hurt. <laughs> 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 I, I didn't have a tactful way to communicate with people in a way that one that that encouraged them to continue the conversation. So I, I remember a specific situation I could tell you. There was a guy from Jamaica and there was a guy from Africa. And in the in the conversation they started talking about how when they came here black Americans um, talked about their accent and their clothes and made them feel bad about who they were and was ranking on them. Y'all know what ranking is, right? And so the African was like, I had the same experience when I first came here. Black Americans talked so bad about me. I used to didn't want to go to school. They talk about my clothes. They talk about my accent. And so Mr. Angry Man was like, Listen, y'all was ranking on each other before you got here. We was ranking on each other before you got here. What make you think we ain't gonna rank on you? <laughs> Come on, man, stop trying to act like this division, we doing something so different. <laughs> and yo, they were so tired of me. But I mean, I could have said that in a, a more tactful way. I'll give you another one. I don't understand how come Americans so lazy. Like for me, at that time, that was like a little trigger. Because when a black person come from another country and call us lazy, I, I didn't think that was cool. So if you can comfortably say that to me, I was spinning off your energy rather than as opposed to directing my own. Mm. So when somebody said to me, oh, I don't understand how black Americans are so lazy. There's so many opportunities here and this, that, and the other. And I would say, well, I don't understand why y'all only wear shoes when y'all go to church. Yeah. Now, are we going to have a conversation or are we going to talk about each other? Which we want to do? Because if we can hurl insults, if you want to do that, I was just very blab. You know, and, and even though I was trying to say, if you want to have a conversation, let's move from a place of understanding as opposed to attacking each other. But I, I didn't have the tools to say it like that because I just had this anger in me. And so, um, and I've learned how to be more effective and harmonious in how I approach conversations. And I, I have so much that I want to share, which is why this, this book is so important. Because how effective we are in communicating has everything to do with um, our ability to listen and have a desire to understand. And when we remove winning and being right from the conversation, that's even better. So. Um, yeah. So first, um, I want to say. of a person's being and connections to uh, where it will affect them and getting through this life isn't just about getting through this life to uh, go go by each day and just wake up and go back to sleep but it is a matter of taking care of your personal being so as we do continue to I understand that you do have your book that you've been planning on talking about so I also wanted to remind everybody who's here I want to thank not only for your attendance, but on your way, 
we have at this table bags for everybody to go home with and 10 piece men travel kit that comes included with mouthwashes, razors, deodorant, all of your personal hygiene needs. And I guess what are our closing remarks? So, um, I have a copy of the first book I, I wrote. It's called The Book of Aid. And this is just a series of my thoughts about a lot of things, because I always say I spend, I believe, I spend more time thinking than the average person. And so that gets me in trouble, because when someone is trying to help you understand their position, but you've already thought about that, up and down and inside out, and then every time they bring something to you, it's, it's kind of similar because you know they don't spend the time thinking. Because you can tell when people don't spend the time thinking about what they believe when you ask them, well, why? Help me understand how you arrived at that. And then people, that's when they realize it's just how they've been taught, you know? So I spend a lot of time thinking about a lot of things, which brings on challenges where once you start rejecting stuff because you thought about it, and you can explain, I take pride in being able to explain why I say things and why I think a certain way. But when you're talking to somebody who doesn't do that, then they start feeling like, oh, you just think you know everything. No, I don't think I know everything. I just know why I think the way I do. And I can tell you why. And sometimes it's rough because it, and you can't tell me why. The only way that I can change how I'm thinking, if it makes more sense, I can. But if you can't tell me why you feel that way, it's hard for me to abandon, abandon what I'm already thinking. So anyway, this is a book. Um, the, I've had people look at the first chapter and just throw the book down. But the, the, it has five chapters. First chapter, my thoughts about God and organized religion. Second chapter is called For the Love of Women. Third chapter is called Race and Culture. The fourth chapter is called My Philosophy. And the final chapter is called Thoughts and Other Theories. And so, I would like to just give this book to a person who could tell me what I said in the beginning about ourselves. I'll give, I'll give you, there's nothing more important. What's the rest of it? I'll get some of someone over with that, but I just have to try and make it. Yes. Was this self love or something? I don't remember. It's like part of the You're close. Self love, uh, self respect, or self responsibility. That's, that's close, but that's not the statement. And I gave you most of it. There's oh, nothing more time. important than how we feel about ourselves. There's nothing more important than how we feel about ourselves. Okay. Let me ask you this. What is the um what is the best way to handle a situation when that adrenaline is flying? Yes. Alright. <laughs> now this is a book. I'm gonna give you one because you have been such a wonderful host and helping me and talking to me and emailing me and everything. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good thing as well.
And um, so this is a book. This book is called Social Media Quotes for Black People Only. The interesting thing about this book is I specifically wrote this book as a lesson in judging a book by its cover. When you begin reading the quotes in this book, you'll realize that anybody who sees value in the quotes can benefit from the book. Because as you search for the quotes for the black people, you won't find any. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a book that is what I call a lesson in judging a book by its cover. Social media quotes for black people only. Um, <laughs> Can somebody tell me what are the three types of grooming that I talked about? Three types of grooming and hygiene? Yeah. Mental, physical, and emotional. There you go. <laughs> you know, and it's funny because that book's laying around and people who are not black look at it. <laughs> and then they start looking for the black. What's the other thing for black people? <laughs> but it's a book that I call A Lesson in Judging Book by its cover. Okay, um, what else can I ask you? Can somebody tell me why it's important to understand that the mind is like a fingerprint? No. <laughs> no, I got some. <laughs> Explain to me why it's important to understand that the mind is like a fingerprint. teetering around the edge, but it has to be more clear. Because you use the word shouldn't. That's the world of non-reality. We want to hang in reality. So it has to be more definitive. Yes? I would say inference. Hmm? Inference. It's, it's vague, but I think it hits it. Um... No. Why is it important to understand that the mind is like a finger? Yeah, the mind is like a fingerprint, right? Yeah, well, why is it important to understand that? The impressions that are left in your mind by the experiences that you have in life. That's the true. imprint that you figure can leave behind on things is complex. I think that's why imprint, but it's okay. I'm gonna <laughs> give you a deck of cards because that's very important what you just said, but you weren't here when I explained it. Yeah. <laughs> now, these are conversation cards. Again, category sex, money, religion, and relationship. These are something I created, I don't know, maybe in 2011, 2012, something like that. Um, next question. For those who were here in the beginning, who did I mention whose body kind of deteriorated and they used technology to communicate? Stephen Hawking? Yeah. Now, I'm telling y'all, with these cards, for those who might consume, you know, some things that make you feel good and all that kind of stuff, I don't want to be watching the news and somebody and pull these cards out and y'all start asking each other these questions. And, and and we have a we have a uh, we have a Google situation. And then they you see the camera go into the house and you see these cars laying all over the table. <laughs> the goal is for us to use these cars to become better communicators, to understand each other better. And they have some real, real direct questions going down. Um, and then also if uh, I'm almost done. Well, any, anyway, after it's over, I can give you uh, my card or whatever. Uh, if you ever 
wanted to get any more. The cards are 20 bucks. That book is $20. That book is $35. Okay, so um, these are compensation cards for a reason. Uh, anybody have a question for me? Any more questions? Any curious questions? Yeah. So what made you want to speak on this? I know that you wanted to gather um, not an audience, but basically to share your experiences. Speak on what? Speak on, um, on mental health and uh, hygiene and your emotional. Because that was the subject matter for today. Like if, if I had picked the subject, it would have been about harmonious and productive communication. And I would have went over the seven guidelines for having a conscious conversation and I, I would have went into what I call my area of expertise. But I've been doing hair for 30 years too, so I can speak in, in reference to hygiene for men and women as well. So that's basically what it was. Yes, sir? I didn't mean to oh, I thought you You start on the forum? Hmm? You start on the forum? I don't run the salon. I rent the store. Would you still work there? Yeah. Okay, good. I need to change my hair. Because you know what? It's always the people with the perfect hair. <laughs> talking about, oh man, I, I, I need some well, hair. Well, I mean, I, I used to have short hair and I grew it out this year. And by the summer, I think I want it short again. So mm -hmm. I might, I'm going to make a stop by. <laughs> I can dig it. Yeah. Okay. I see how. It was happenstance. Like, I was, I was in college and school at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Short story, long story short. I ran out of money in my junior year. Came home with plans on going back to Finney. My brother, who was already in the cosmetology, my sister, who was in the cosmetology, my mother, my father, they were already in, in, into that world, my aunt. But I never was really into it. So he said, well, you should ch check out their cosmetology school. They'll get you some money. They'll come up with money. And I said, how are they going to come up with money for me to go to cosmetology school? And they couldn't come up with more money for me to finish at ODU. He said, you go down there. They'll find you some money. I went. They found me some money. I went to cosmetology school. That's basically how it happened. And there was nothing that turned out right. I quit cosmetology school like four or five times. <laughs> and then I got a career job at the post office and I thought I was set. Oh, benefits, money, boom, I'm good. Er, er. There's no job in the history of human life that I hated worse than working at the post office, midnight to 8.30. <laughs> so I had to beg. It got so bad, my, my, my nights off was Wednesday and Thursday. But I would just take Friday and Saturday too, and then I'd go back on Sunday. Totally, I hated that job. And so I went back to cosmetology school and said, can y'all please let me give another chance to come back? But I went back with a plan. I said, I'm gonna focus on barbering so by the time I finish, I can at least make money barbering. So that's what I did. Because I knew I wasn't going to women's hair without, that wasn't happening, that was a complete failure. And my ego is why I kept quitting because I saw my brothers and sisters and everybody doing it, and I knew how it was supposed to look, but for whatever reason, I couldn't do that. And I was used to just picking up anything and just being good at it. But the hair thing it didn't work out like that. So that's what happened. I made the plan. I was in. I would go to work midnight to eight thirty, and then I would go to cosmetology school nine to four thirty. And that I had to do that for three months. And that was talking about never getting any sleep. But y'all know about that. <laughs> so, um, so that's basically how that. And the beautiful thing, like y'all have a chance to choose. I told you I'm 61. By the time, I, I didn't choose being a loving to speak. I didn't, I love to speak and share information. I've been doing it for like 20 years. I spoke in prisons, high schools, universities, all that kind of stuff. And, but I didn't have a solid 
foundation of what I wanted to build, what I wanted to specialize in something so I could get specific opportunity, I can get consistent opportunities to speak. So um, that's why I started writing. And, um, and that's where this, this next book about communication, it's like if I had been done now, it would have been such a perfect time with the energy around the country and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really working hard to get that thing done. But um, I, I love standing before people and sharing information. That's where I am now. And I discovered that at 54. My, my I, harmonious and productive communication. Oh, okay. So I'm not like the rah-rah guy. That just rolls right off the tongue. It's just harmonious. in my ears. I didn't hear it. I, yeah. I'm harmonious what? Harmonious and productive communication. Productive communication. Harmonious oh. and productive. Okay. Yeah. figured out when I went. This is, for me, this is the greatest thing in the world, to stand in front of people and speak and share information. But I wanted to have something that was close to me and based on my experience with interaction, human interaction and communication, I said, that's where it needs to be because I can speak from experience in my own. And this is what makes me an expert. This one woman, because I didn't finish the degree program, and she said, I'm gonna find a way for you to go back to school and finish your degree and get your master's. I was like, you know, at this stage of the game, like, and she said, there's no at this stage of the game. You can still do it. <laughs> you know, and I'm saying, that's true. I mean, and like you said, I, I have a son, he is 23 years old, and his mother is constantly like destroying him for not making a decision. I'm saying, you know, and I try to tell them that I, I didn't figure this out till 54. Every, every, everything else I did was just where I fell into. It was happenstance. It wasn't like I made this choice. When I graduated high school, I had my art teacher telling me they were going to just hurt me if I didn't pursue art, the painting and drawing and all that stuff. That was, they used to, that was just what I did. I had a sewing teacher trying to get me to get into, uh, fashion and design. And the culinary arts teacher got me accepted, helped get me accepted to two of the best cooking schools in the United States. And I wound up going to school for computer science. And uh, doing an internship at Aetna and realizing I hated sitting at the desk with a the tie. There was just no way that was gonna work for me. So, you know, you go through things and you start discovering yourself and finding out what works for you. And that's, that's the name of that team. So, so this might be. It seems like you're going to have to have him come back to talk about the con conscious conversation. Yeah. Um, and I want you guys to share these cards and uh, introduce people to them. And um, if they see the value in them, and you know, you know, you can you can get them from me. <laughs> and I and I also <laughs> want to. Thank you for taking the time to listen because one of the greatest skills in the history of human existence is having the ability to listen for the purpose of understanding. Listen for the purpose of understanding. Not listening to wait for my opportunity. Listening for the purpose of understanding. So, um, And anybody want a card? This is my card. So, I thank you very much. It's been enjoyable.
hope you got something out of it that's valuable to you. And uh, thanks for having me. Can you tell me what the brotherhood and the sisterhood is about? What is it about? How did you get started? <laughs> brotherhood. Just, just give me a quick. <laughs> Hold on. You got it. Right. So basically, um, we focus on the uh, wellness, health, and retention of college men on campus. Mm -hmm. um, we provide, we have a Monday meeting that is men only, that is our connection. It's just basically a therapy group where we come in and talk about our issues. Um, with Fabio, the, the leader of it. Um, and it's basically just to better ourselves in every situation possible. And I can say true and true that if I didn't join it my freshman year, I wouldn't still be here right now. So um, it saved me, uh, it saved my college career, and I hope it can continue to save other college men. Um, we're trying to lower, the, or no, we're trying to raise the graduation rate of men on this campus because it is astronomically low. Um, and we're trying to inspire other schools to do the same. Um, yeah. That's that's awesome. What is the graduation rate for men on this campus? Seven. Uh, uh,
And then, um, Brother Al Al Alfonso, we would like to do a picture before you leave as well. And we have some okay. students. They want to say that males are coming to college no, with right. academic debt. That is true, but that's not the same. That's not that's this whole picture. picture. Total picture is wrapped up in two. Total factor, what we're talking about, the ability to navigate oh, mental health and emotional oh, issues like he's talking oh, about, oh, it's just fit. It's just fit. Because what are men talking to? What are men talking to? They want to Okay, so my religion. My religion. Men are less likely than is the female counterparts to ask for help. So if they're not asking for life help, then they're not affirming behavior. Life affirming behavior is when Drop I am involved Drop in down. activities that could help to improve the quality of who I am. And contribute to so the numbers are really contributing to, to the decisions that men are making. The philosophy no, associated with my religion, which is life is 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 like is if it's not it's life affirming, men are choosing not to do the very things that it's you amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. You are either an entertainer or a salary you quit. You exist to help you. Yeah, the foundation for the, the activity, activity is whole if it's not there. life affirming. Okay, which is uh, making choices that are in your best interest. Uh, working to improve the quality of who I am and contribute to improving the quality of my reality. You gotta if it's not life affirming, then it's in the future. That means you are either a pure entertainer or mm -hmm. to our purpose. Right. And that is your only purpose in this space. So you that's that. my religion. First of all, we have two more shirts for you. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> I, I wear a t-shirt, so I'll take it. Um, and then I'll also sign this. Time to find it out after <laughs> I don't know. I know it's kind of paper is a little shiny. Yeah, yeah. Um, What's your name? Oh, Kate. 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 Remember how you said the females are more engaged? They got to hear expression and got connected. Mm -hmm. You got to be somewhere around. You're going You're a transfer? Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm intrigued to read it. <laughs> I think a lot of what you said, like, like really thought about it and 